Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. I'm Phoenix Soleil, and I'm a partner at Lith Economy. My guest today is Sarah Payton. She's a certified NVC, nonviolent communication trainer and neuroscience educator. She offers trainers that support strategies for clear communication and effective management approaches that elicit a whole brain workforce. She teaches and lectures internationally on the relational neuroscience and how language changes the brain. And she's the author of the book, Your Resonant Self, Guided Meditations and Exercises to Engage Your Brain's Capacity for Healing. Her work focuses on how we hear and understand one another, effective ways to connect hearts and develop flexibility, responsiveness, and clarity. I've talked about your work with other LIFT members, and now most of us are reading your book. (laughs) I have watched some of (laughs) your webinars. So you have groupies here now. (laughs) Wonderful. Yeah. So I wanted you on the show because our listeners are people who want to use business as a force for good. They're interested in changing systems. And one of the things that we run into is that what's amazing is that there's lots of solutions to some of the what we consider the intractable problems like regenerative agriculture. How do we handle climate change? What are forms for helping people live for a community? But then the thing is, how do you change the hearts and minds of people so that they can be more collaborative? How do you make them open to using systems that are different than what they're using? And so why I get excited about books like yours is that it gives us some insight into how the mind works and helps us see how we might have assumptions about human behavior that are uh, false and maybe create more challenges in the kind of work we do. How would you describe your work? I would describe my work as being very interested in really what, what are the foundations of change? How do people start to think differently? What changes the way we think? Because human brains really don't like change. (laughs) They don't like to change what they're thinking. You know, they choose somebody to vote for and they're like, I'm just going to vote for this person no matter what. It's like their feedback loops are just closed. And what we need for business more than anything else is we need the feedback loops open so that we can have those experiences of making a plan, doing the plan, testing whether the plan worked and then revising the plan so that we can stay current with the world and respond to the world's problems and create new solutions, like you were saying. So it's quite a fun, interesting, odd riddle. How do human brains change? And how did you get interested in that work? Well, I got interested in it through Marshall Rosenberg, who was the guy who founded Nonviolent Communication. And he was talking about brain change. And I listened to his book a couple of times and I was like, this man is really interesting. I've never heard anybody talk about brains changing before. And so I went to see him speak and it was towards the end of his life. And he was kind of, he did this like word for word, the same thing that was in the book. And I was like, oh, man, I paid for a three-day workshop. I'm going to do. I know this guy by heart. And here he is. He's just doing himself by heart. He knows himself by heart, too. So one of the people there stood up and said, I'm going to do an empathy circle. And I thought, what's an empathy circle? Well, we'll go find out. And I had an experience of being held in a circle with a really big dilemma and people not giving me advice and just, like, really accompanying me. and. I had a transformative experience where I stopped doing what I had been doing and started doing something new that I hadn't been able to change. And it was effortless. And I was like, well, what the heck just happened? So I started to learn about neuroscience because what the heck did just happen? That's what I love more than anything else is when people's brains shift and change. Yeah. And we need it. We need it. <laughs> 
when you said effortless, I was like, oh my God, I want to talk to you about my <laughs> procrastination problem. I want to talk to you about, <laughs> because, so we have people who, you know, that's one of the things is how do you work with colleagues? Because a lot of our clients are people who work in co-ops. And what's great about co-ops is that you're taking away a lot of the business as usual form for some of the hierarchy systems. And you're trying to create a system where everyone has a say, which is great for creativity. I mean, there's so many pluses to it, but a lot of people aren't trained to how do you influence, how do you make decisions in a community with other people's brains, their backgrounds, their families, like you want people to bring their whole self in. But I think also people are a little scared of bringing, of people bringing their whole self in because there's an idea that professionalism is about, I'm going to bring this face to work and then I go home and that's where I'm supposed to be able to just leave all of my issues behind. So you get into a group and in traditional hierarchy, someone just does, you just tell someone what to do and they might disagree with it, but they, you're paying them and there's, there's that. But you're, when you're suddenly bringing in people who have about equal power, yeah, a lot of things could come up. And I was wondering if you had what insights your work has, can offer in those situations. One of the things that relational neuroscience gives us is it gives us a sense of what kinds of patterns we repeat and why we repeat them. So if we think of ourselves as a member of a workforce, there are going to be some certain patterns that we have relationally. We'll be more likely to be resistant to new stuff or more likely to be on the forefront of change. We might be more likely to be a stickler for the rules or more likely to be an innovator. And all of these qualities can be very helpful in certain situations and very unhelpful in other situations. So for the bringing the whole brain person, the whole person into the workforce, one of the things we're looking for is, is flexibility. Like what are the qualities that this person has that will really support the mission, whatever the mission is, the co-op mission or the insurance company mission. And when we're asking how do we support the mission, in today's world, we need a lot of flexibility. The world is changing so quickly. When my son was in school, he was 21 now, so this was like 15 years ago, the guy who was running the school said, we are preparing kids for a future that we can't imagine. We're preparing kids for jobs that we don't know the names of. And so I think everybody needs like a flexibility. now. Given that we don't like change and that we bring our patterns from other places with us, starting to think of ourselves systemically can be really important. So if we bring a pattern from the past of like being a stickler for details, we can say, okay, how did this quality of being a stickler for details, how did this serve my original systems? How did it serve me? in my family of origin? How did it serve me or how did it serve my system in my very first job? I remember in my very first job, I was trying to be really relational. And all of a sudden I realized, heck, these people don't want relationality. They want me to get get what's done done as quickly as possible and get out and let everything else happen. And it was like a revelation, but it was a funny revelation because then I carried that with me. And then it was harder to be relational in subsequent jobs. So we're thinking about what did we discover that really worked and how are we carrying it with us and how might it no longer serve are some of the questions we can ask when we're thinking about bringing the whole person into the workforce. Unmute. Okay. So it's about appreciating where it has been useful as a first step into being able to change a pattern is appreciating it. Yeah. And... And seeing how it served not just us, but our larger systems. Because stuff like when in the very beginning, it was sort of a one-off, but you said, let's talk about my procrastination. (laughs) (laughs) The, The question is for all of us, how did procrastination serve us as little people? How did it let our moms catch up with us? How did it keep us from leaving people behind? How did it make us fit into our systems? How did it support the system as a whole? And it's really interesting to begin to think about these patterns that we think of as life-destructive or self-sabotaging patterns. How are these patterns actually, how do they start out at any rate as life-serving patterns? 
Right. And how do you suggest people? Well, I guess there are people can do their work on themselves, but how do you have a conversation with someone else about these things? Because as soon as you start saying little people, when we were, you were already on the edge of what is acceptable to talk about at work. And then you went off of it because. (laughs) That's true. That's so true. So I think we can talk about past workplaces though. Yes. How did this pattern serve us in a past workplace? And there's something here about in co-ops and in organizations that are considered more teal organizations, one of the things that happens along with that flattening of the power structure that you referred to is that people become interested in improving their own performance. Now, if somebody is actually interested in improving their own performance, they're much more open to dialogue, to support, to coaching, to new ideas. If mm. someone's, if the feedback about our, our performance is coming from the outside rather than from a, a motivated inner place, then it's much more difficult to get into these conversations. It's much mm. more difficult to say, how did you function in your past systems? What do you want to say about that? How is that reflecting here? Which is a fun question but isn't so fun if it comes with anything punitive, which so often feedback performance reviews are all about, are you going to get a 3% raise or not? So the audience that's listening to this call might be, you know, interested in this idea of being interested in a feedback for ourselves for our own sakes. Right. How do you prove that that's going to be a fruitful conversation versus a punitive. Just thinking about, it's also complicated because sometimes it might work to say to someone, okay, where is this coming from? And to have an inquiry that way. But one of the things that I've had to do as a consultant is that sometimes you have situations where because of whatever someone's past is, it feels like it's beyond the ability of the organization to handle it. And when you open that door to more reflection type, I mean, I don't think what you're saying is necessarily on that line, but I guess one of the fears is that how much do you engage in a kind of open exploration of of someone's psychology, if, if that's an appropriate word, in a workplace? Yeah, One of the questions when people aren't able to meet their performance intentions or goals or whatever their job performance expectations are, one of the questions that we can always ask, we can't really answer it so effectively within the workforce, is, is this a question of trauma? Mm -hmm. So if it's a question of trauma, then special help is needed. Then special therapy is needed, special coaching is needed for people to be able to begin to shift. And I'm a huge advocate for coaching and consulting and therapeutic interventions to be done by people who are therapists, by people who are coaches, by people who are guides and consultants. I mean, I think that it's hugely important to have people who understand relational neuroscience stepping into these roles so that trauma can be resolved quickly with evidence-based strategies that allow shifts and changes to happen. I've just been following a podcast on heart rate variability and the fellow doing the podcast this this week, he was talking about how can organizations use a metric like heart rate variability to be able to track well-being, to be able to to track the well-being of the workforce within the company, which is Whenever we're talking about metrics and tracking, again, things can be used punitively and things can be used in a spirit of exploration and support. So a part of this is intention, a part of this is getting really good support, and a part of this is also beginning to see that when people can't do what we want them to do, there's a tendency, a a temptation in our world to think of people as being obstructive or lazy or non-responsive. But as we start to learn the relational neuroscience, we see, oh, this is paralysis. This is the after effects of trauma. This is not somebody being obstreperous and, and trying to cause problems. This is something else entirely. 
And that brings more relaxation to everybody because the more that we're in a spirit of blame and recrimination, the less well a workplace is functioning. Can you give an example of those evidence-based strategies that help with trauma? Within the world of therapy, we see beautiful results with things like EMDR. We see great results with brain spotting, and we see great results with something called CMR, which is where people kind of time travel to the traumatic moment and and reclaim their frozen self. So those are the kinds of things that we can reach out for help for from within a workforce, obviously. Within a workforce, we're not therapists. We're just trying to get stuff done. Yeah. And I mean, I, I would imagine that this requires someone to take initiative. Like this is not something that other people can push on someone. Yeah, except in a confidential and spontaneous conversation, if we're saying, you know, George, you haven't been to work on time once in the last two weeks, and we need you to be on time. And I don't think this is you doing it on purpose. I think this is you running into something from your past. Do you have any willingness to get some therapy or some coaching here in this area to be able to help us all? People are often much more amenable to that than one would expect, especially mm-hmm. if we have some resources on tap to steer people toward because it can be a little overwhelming trying to figure out not just that we have a problem that comes from trauma but also how the heck to find somebody good to work with yeah what i love about what you just said is that it's already creating this idea that hey this is this is just a human thing could you get some help and there's a lot of compassion. And I mean, I think that's one of the gifts of doing work in neuroscience and and learning about trauma is that it takes away from this idea that there are evil people. It feels like trauma explains a lot of the horrible things that people do. For example, that if you've been traumatized, you are compelled to act out that trauma as it's the nervous system trying to heal, but it looks like someone is just doing it again and again from a malevolent place. Yeah. At the same time, I've seen situations where a situation keeps going because the person doesn't get help or maybe the help that they need just takes a lot longer than the timeline. It's complicated because, you know, people can be so holding on to that strategy of everyone can be changed, which is true. And sometimes there are limits, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, when we're talking about a teal organization or an organization like a co-op or, or an organization that's really committed to leveling the power structures, one of the things we're looking at usually is kind of teams where teams are looking at each other and trying to figure out how best to work together. And the kinds of conversations that can happen in a team can be remarkably supportive of everybody, even in the case of a separation from the workforce. So even in the case of letting somebody go, the process can be meaningful and life-connected instead of life-destroying, which so often happens when people are fired. The kinds of conversations that we can have, like, for example, if you've got a company that's doing a reduction in force and we're working with the team trying to figure out what's the best move for everybody. Questions that can be asked that are rarely asked when we're doing reduction in force, like who can afford to go? Who has enough savings? Who has enough inheritance? Who has enough property that's bringing in money? Who can afford to go? Or who can afford to take a wage cut or a salary cut? Who's got a little kid that you know, that's on a medical insurance and and the family will really suffer if that little kid gets their medical insurance stopped. You know, people get to make a different kind of decision together for each other's well-being in these new power-flattened situations that can transform the traditional way of dealing with things like reduction in force or also things like, you know, problems with carrying out the job performance. You know, it's really different to say to somebody, you're not measuring up and you're fired, as opposed to, hey, here are the job performance expectations. 
What's your sense of how you're doing? Let's look at what we know about how you're doing. Do you think this is the right job for you? Because I'm getting a sense this might not be the right job for you, given that you're not able to do what the job actually asks for. What's your sense of this? It's a very different way to bring the conversation to people uh, compared to you didn't do it, you didn't measure up, that's it, you're out. True. And we've been mentioning Teal, and I just want to take time to, in case people don't know, you're talking about Reinventing Organizations book? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you could say a little bit about what you mean by Teal. Yeah. Sure. There was a fellow named Ken Wilbur who worked with the uh, this idea of different colors for different I think he brought it from somebody else but he did some very significant work on it with different colors for different levels different ways of thinking about what is the goal of the organization so for certain organizations the goal is profit 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 there's no real sense of mission there's a sense of, there's not a sense of wanting to change the world. There's a sense of like, let's make money. <laughs> let's make money as effectively and efficiently as we can with as little thought for the environment as possible. <laughs> sort of. And then you start to move into organizations taking more and more care for mm. the environment, for the people, for the workforce, and beginning to think about it's sort of a natural evolution that we start to think about how can we bring relational neuroscience? How can we bring what we know about humans? How can we bring collaboration into the workforce and change the traditional hierarchical structure of the workforce? So Frederick Lalu is the fellow who wrote the book Reinventing Organizations. And he talks a lot about this movement of organizations into a thought, really thoughtful power structure. And the flattened power structure invites contribution. Talk about a whole person contribution. There's something quite amazing that happens if you take the people who are most responsible for the secretarial and admin section of a company and you let them talk about how are things going? How's it really working? Am I working up to my capacity? Are my neighbors working up to their capacity? Is there a way the system could be improved? They're the ones who know the system. And so, if, and so they get to bring their creativity and their thoughtfulness to the system. Now, it takes an enormous commitment from the upper levels of the organization not to turn it back into a pyramidal hierarchy. But there are such good success stories coming from these organizations about what creative ways to solve problems. Right. And in your experience... I can imagine some people are hearing this and saying, this is wonderful, but they haven't experienced this. It took me many years in the workforce before I was in where I experienced what you're talking about. And some people may never experience it. I think the popular idea is that you can't have that and a sustainable organization. And I was wondering if you could speak to that. What models have you seen or experienced where you've seen examples of it working and -hmm. being sustainable? Mm -hmm. First of all, (laughs) I'd like to acknowledge that when we use the word sustainable and then also the word successful in today's world, we're looking at things like CEOs bringing in $13 million, or we're looking at things like Jeff Bezos, you know, making so much since coronavirus started and how much he could raise the salary of every single employee that he has and not even notice that the money was missing. So there's, a <laughs> so I always kind of take that word sustainable with a grain of salt because are we talking about sustainable where you're making sure that the people who have a share, you know, a stock share in your organization are getting a good return on their stock investment or are we talking about sustainable in terms of everybody getting a living wage and being able to create a good, solid mission in this world that changes the world. So just Just to clarify, I'm talking about the latter, because (laughs) while there are B Corps and conscious businesses who are doing really well in the stock market, Mm -hmm. they definitely help break the, uh, some models. I think a, a lot of people doing great are entrepreneurs who might have a very small staff. Yes. They're like pioneers. They feel very alone and they're trying to figure out how to treat people well and compete against those companies who don't have that goal. Yeah. 
Well, I myself am a small entrepreneur and work with a wonderful, wonderful collection of people who tell me what they can do and tell me when they want to work and help me figure out how much to pay them and help me figure out if we need more people. Like if the workload is exceeding what we've got people for. So my own experience of this is as a small entrepreneur, find people you really like who like what they're doing and let them tell you how to make it better and see what happens because it just makes one's life better if the people that we're working with are truly engaged and can contribute to their maximum. It means letting go of micromanaging. It's just not possible to micromanage and have an organization where everybody gets to contribute. One of the things I had the pleasure of listening to is are you talking about right brain and left brain? And you can say it better than me, but one of the things I, I got out of that is how flexibility is tied to someone's ability to connect to their emotions and grieve and process emotion. Yeah. Um, please correct me if I miss. Um, yeah. We, as all animals, have two hemispheres of the brain, have a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. And we see that there are differences between the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere across the animal kingdom. So across the animal kingdom, even in birds like pigeons, they'll use their right hemisphere, which is the activation of the left eye, to scan the world for predators and to see the big picture. And they'll use their left hemisphere, which is channeled through the right eye, to look at telling details like, is that a seed or is that a little piece of gravel? Is that a piece of dirt? Can I eat that? And so we also have this bihemispheric split where one hemisphere really has the neuronal structure to capture the big picture. Mm -hmm. And the other hemisphere really has the neuronal structure to stay with details. Mm -hmm. And the part that can capture the big picture appears to be quite a bit more relational among humans. Like we're looking at relationship. And this goes across species too, because our dogs will actually watch their owner's left eyes, which rigs to their right hemisphere, to be able to track what's happening for their owners emotionally, mm -hmm. which dogs appear to think is important. I think we should listen to that. <laughs> yeah, and I can hear your dog in the background. Cool. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> yeah. How is this of interest in the workplace? For me, this is of interest in the workplace because if we're able to have a relational and appreciative relationship connection with our employees, if we have this relational connection, then we're inviting both hemispheres. Now, if we say we don't want emotions in the workplace, we're a little bit throwing out people's capacity to see big picture and to become collaborative and to notice their own strengths and those of their team members. Mm. Because all of the things that are connected, if we're trying to close off the hemisphere that's got the emotions in it, then we're closing off the hemisphere that's innovative and that's thoughtful and that considers the big picture and can see and understand feedback and create new systems integrating the information that the feedback is bringing us. So it's all well and good to say that we're supposed to be professional and there's no room for grief in the workplace and we shouldn't ever let anybody know what's happening. But there's something quite extraordinary that happens when we do make room for emotion, when we explicitly say, you know, 30 seconds, the first 30 seconds, just tell us an emotion that you're experiencing right now, not something connected with the workplace necessarily, just like I'm an emotion from your whole world. And we model vulnerability as the people who are running the meetings. And we say, oh, just in this moment, I noticed that I'm really worried about my mother-in-law. And just, it's kind of scary. And I'm really wanting her well-being. And that's, that's what's here for me right now. And just kind of take it around so that people are there. So that they know that their whole being is welcome. It's a small time investment, but it yields a huge return in terms of getting people's whole brains to the work table. I appreciate this. And at the simultaneously, 
I worry about that because it works sometimes. And then there can be a feeling that you are creating a situation where people can feel overly responsible for each other. And overly responsible is hard because <laughs> like when, as soon as I said it, I was like, is that the word I want to use? Or I guess the word is that when you don't have the capacity to support someone to the degree that they need is maybe a better word I want to use. And a lot of people don't have skills to handle themselves, much less other people. I was just thinking about our entrepreneurs who are sometimes having to work with colleagues who have skills and might, that they need and might not have the best relational skills. And then also dealing with clients and also wanting to promote things to a world that has different values. Yeah, it's very tricky because when we do open the door to mm. the right Spirit, we're also opening the door to where trauma lives in the human brain. Mm. So here we are, entrepreneurs, business people, people who are leaders of teams, thinking, how can I actually let in what I want to let in and keep out what I want to keep out? <laughs> <laughs> and and acknowledge any places where I have I haven't got much capacity and be okay with it. There are a number of sort of strategies that can be helpful. I mean, we can never get away entirely from the possibility that we say, what's going on emotionally? Let's take 30 seconds each. And somebody doesn't just break down sobbing. And you're like, what the heck am I going to do with a sobbing person? It's been a minute and a half they've been <laughs> sobbing. We need to get to the rest of the meeting. I should never have mentioned emotions, right? You've named my nightmare, yes. <laughs> exactly. Our own emotional literacy and starting to understand the concept of accompaniment becomes really important if we're stepping into this. Learning how to name what's happening with our bodies and with our emotions, modeling it if we're modeling it for teams or for workplaces. It's like a whole nother skill that we have neglected in our business education. And yet, it is a skill that's of huge importance if we want to have a whole brain workplace. So just like any other skill, just like learning about time management, people get all kinds of coaching for time management, or learning about how to organize and run a stockholder meeting. You know, people get coaching on that. They practice in advance. We need to learn that this particular area of development is important and that we can invest time and money into becoming more effective and proficient in connecting with ourselves and others emotionally so that we know what to do when somebody's sobbing. Our human bodies know what to do when somebody's sobbing. Our human bodies know that most often, not always, but most often what's needed is some kind of contact or some kind of sense that we're not alone. So what happens if we ask consent for touch in those moments? Hey, this is rough. Can I put my hand on your back? And can we all just take a minute of silence, being with this and acknowledging how huge it is? And then after a minute of silence saying, okay, that was our minute. Friend, do you need, you know, do you need to be able to yeah, you you okay to continue because we've got to keep moving here. Do you need to go and get some other support or take care of yourself in some way? We get to ask those questions. We get to both make room for the emotional aliveness of what's happening and learn how to come back to the matter at hand and make space for people to be able to figure out self-care in the middle of that. It's like a movement into having self-responsibility ourselves and an expectation of self-responsibility for the folks that we're working with that allows them to begin to learn their own self-responsibility. And I think having trained as a facilitator, that's one of the things that I can do is be able to handle when those things happen. And I know it requires a lot of emotional intelligence. And that's the thing. I think what you're saying is that, and I, I think this, that we can't separate out that we all need to increase our ability to handle ourselves and others as part of what a new economy requires. That these are, are not skills that we're taught in schools and sometimes not in our families. And sometimes what goes for mainstream 
dream is counter the things that are healthy for all of us. Yeah, are we willing to invest in a whole new skill area? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's got great payback, but it might take a while. One of the questions I had is one of the things that your work about contracts, Mm. because I feel that because understanding that there might be decisions that we've made that would make us more comfortable or less able to make changes in oppressive systems. Like I'm thinking about where you were talking in one webinar about someone might be as a child horrified at poverty and then have to make a decision, something similar. I probably am not getting it exactly right, but something similar to, I promise I will not look at this so that I can have a sense of belonging with my family and my class. I just wanted to touch on it at least because it just gives another way of understanding why is it that our our society is the way it is? Like, why is it that a whole group of people could seem to be aligned on something that seems to us abhorrent? Yeah. There are a couple of different answers to this. And then there's also the unconscious contract work, which is my next book, which comes out from Norton in the spring, summer, in the summer season of 2021, if COVID doesn't delay (laughs) schedules. So one of the things we need to know is that we live in a dominant culture. We do get to swim against the stream of our dominant culture which people listening to this radio show are already doing. (laughs) And we get to begin to acknowledge the extent to which our cells, our very cells, feel strange when we go against the dominant culture. So whatever the dominant culture says, if it says we're supposed to turn away from people who are unhoused, if we're supposed to only give money to certified nonprofits that are vetted by the by governmental agencies, if we have this sense that we're all just completely alone and no one's going to help us and we live in a world where there is no community and we just need to keep all of our resources for ourselves for our old age. These are kind of ideas that are really intensely embedded in our culture, in our North American culture at any rate in the United States. If we start to think differently, if we start to, even if we start to think, I really want to create community. I want to be Mm. really involved in my church. I want to give more to my local food shelter. I want to do more for my world. We're actually starting to swim against the stream. And if we're, if we say, I want to go against the dominant culture of business, then there's a cost that our cells pay. Mm. And so this is why podcasts like this are so important because they do create a community in which we can exist with our own longings that are not necessarily connected to the dominant culture, that may be counter to the dominant culture. Values of community, values of flat leadership, values of everybody contributing, values of really listening to the people that are participating in our enterprises. All of these things flow against the dominant stream, and there's a price we pay, a price we pay for stepping out of the dominant stream. Thank you for naming that. It could be a sense of embarrassment or just a sense of confusion, a real sense of isolation, like I can't talk about this with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And our fear that you'll be attacked. Yeah. Or told that you're wrong or told that you're wasting time or that you're going to get yourself in trouble with people's trauma and they're going to weep at the business meeting and you won't be able to stop them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So that's one element is just to begin to acknowledge ourselves, have gentleness for ourselves in our life journey and where it's taking us and how it may take us against and how it might lead us to swim upstream a bit. Then the second thing is that is this question of unconscious contracts. So here we are in a business environment. We're very familiar with contracts. Contracts are agreements that we put in place that have repercussions and consequences if the agreement is not kept. And there's a way that our little personal systems are no different than our business systems, than our bigger systems. And we make contracts 
very often with ourselves in order to avoid the pain and discomfort of previous traumatic experiences. So if we kind of circle back to a possible starting point from earlier in our conversation, I said, what if we're the kind of person who is a stickler for details? And what if we made an agreement with ourselves to be incredibly careful with the details because we had the experience of being punished, perhaps at home, perhaps early in our working career, being punished for not paying attention to details. And so we made a contract with ourselves, a contract we don't even know about, to always put the details first, to prioritize the details ahead of the big picture, ahead of everything else, and to just stay with the details in order to be absolutely safe, and then no matter the cost to ourselves. So if we have this contract, and we don't know we have the contract, then we're simply at the mercy of it. And oftentimes we look at the contracts that we have and we believe that they are us. We believe that we are defined by this particular action. Well, I'm just a stickler for detail. That's all I can do, we'll say. But it's not actually our personality. It's actually that we had a trauma experience that left us making this agreement with ourselves that we're just going to stay with the details and that's going to keep us safe no matter the cost to ourselves and others. Mm. And as we start to become aware of that, then we can go, okay, I see that I have that contract. I'm guessing it's probably not my personality. I'm guessing that I made that contract in a traumatic situation. And in fact, I can actually remember one or two traumatic situations that would have led me to make this contract. And now that I can see it, I wonder what would happen if I let it go. I wonder what would happen if I said, Sarah, I release you from this contract and I revoke this vow. And instead, I give you my permission, my blessing, my allowance, my encouragement. I give you my encouragement to to start to check in with the big picture. Just do a couple details and then check in with the big picture. Do a couple more details and then check in with the big picture. And that's the sort of thing that we can start to change. And this is the sort of thing that often happens with coaches or with therapists, because it's not the sort of work that we usually, you know, share with our cubicle buddy. (laughs) I mean, I would love to live in a world where we shared that with our cubicle buddies, but at this point, we probably are more likely to do it with a coach or a therapist. True. And I think we we need those resources in our life. Speaking of resources, what is the work that you're doing? How do people connect more to you if they're interested in learning more? My website is empathybrain.com, one word, empathy brain. And here's the book, Your Resonant Self, came out from Norton Publishing in 2017. And then I have another book coming out in the summer, the Your Resonant Self Workbook, which will talk about contracts. So you can kind of keep an eye out for that. There are free meditations if you want to start changing your brain with guided meditations and self-warmth, and those are available on the website. And then I do lots of webinars right now because of COVID. Everything's online. Everybody who's interested will be able to find offerings that are coming up soon. The ones that are coming up in the next week include uh, some work that's called Constellation Work. One that's about trauma and constellations and another that's about what happens if we start to think about how the parts of our brain are interacting with our systems that's happening next weekend. So those kinds of things are always underway and can be found very easily on the website. Yeah, if you get a chance to check out her constellation work, it's amazing. But yeah, we're running out of time, unfortunately. You also have just a wealth of webinars about things from different emotions, how to repair a rupture in a relationship, different things about relationships. So you're definitely a resource for people who are wanting to increase their emotional intelligence. Yeah, and I have a series that'll be out very soon a series of free podcasts with my friend Rajkumari Niyogi talking about the return on investment of emotional intelligence in the workplace. So 
That's, I was trying to find a link for it before I got on here, but I can't figure out how to link to it because it's not completely produced yet. So okay. if that's of interest to you, just get on my mailing list and we'll send out information about that as it becomes more available. Sounds good. I guess we're, yeah, have to end, but I'm just so excited. Thank you for um, taking the time to speak with us and share your knowledge. And yeah, I'm glad that you're doing the work you're doing. Thank you. Me too for you, Phoenix. Thank you for having me. Next Economy Now is a production of Lift Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.